what God intended for us to have and what they had when it was first presented. Well, we've learned in our study that the Greek text has been authenticated. The New Testament is the best attested book from antiquity. Those who suggest that we've lost God's Word because of all of these uh, textual variants is simply either uninformed or deliberately misrepresenting the evidence. The Greek text has been authenticated. Then we move to the question, well, what about translation? And we discovered that the actual process of translating from one language, a parent language, to a receptor language, so from Greek into English, can be achieved using the Greek text that has been authenticated. We now turn our attention to a third proof, a third reason why we know the Bible has been preserved accurately. And that is because the differences in English translation are in fact decipherable. We can sort out the differences. I'd like to give you an indication very briefly, a sketch of history showing the historical line of English revisions. You know, the Hebrew Old Testament was complete by about 500 B.C. That's probably when the last writer, Malachi, probably wrote his book. And, of course, the beginning would go back to Moses 1500. So about a thousand year there period there, God conveyed the Old Testament. And then in the first century, God commenced to reveal the New Testament, beginning probably in the 50s with uh, some of Paul's letters and then others written a little later, and perhaps John's closer to the end of the first century. So by 100 A.D., the Greek New Testament had been revealed. It had been given through these various New Testament writers. And consequently, I would suggest to you very strongly, the Bible constitutes the totality of God's communication to the human race. I say that firmly without fear of contradiction. All other books that claim to be of divine origin can be shown to be mere human productions. Now notice that as God's Word was completed in Hebrew and Greek primarily, there would have been this immediate need for translation as we spoke of in a previous session. And consequently, Latin was a very dominant language in the Roman Empire, and therefore the Greek was put into Latin by about 404 A.D. And so that, that constituted a major manifestation of God's Word uh, through really the Middle Ages for the next thousand years. But coming out of the Middle Ages in European and specifically uh, English-speaking countries, there became the desire coming out of the Dark Ages to have God's Word in the language of the common people. Most people didn't speak Latin, for example, in England in 13 or 1400. So people began yearning for it to be in English. Well, I mean no unkindness, but the historical facts show that the Roman Catholic Church resisted that tendency and felt the people did not need the Word of God. They needed to simply listen to their priests. Well, a very valiant fellow by the name of John Wycliffe came onto the scene and he was the first person to provide an English translation of the Bible. He believed the average person could learn God's Word. And so he spent his life trying to facilitate that. And that did not make church authorities happy. In fact, the Council of Constance in 1415 ordered Wycliffe's body disinterred, burned, and his ashes thrown into the river swift. They did not appreciate his efforts to translate the Bible into the language of the average English-speaking person. Wycliffe's work was followed by another, I would say, valiant individual. William Tyndale was his name, and in 1525, he became the first person to provide a printed English translation of the New Testament. In fact, he overheard one day a cleric, you know, a, a priestly type person, a religious person uh, who holds a formal position. He heard this fellow say that, you know, people would be better off without God's laws than the Pope's laws. Well, Tyndale said, if God spared his life, he would make the plowboy know more scripture than the cleric. You know, copies that he uh, put together were smuggled into England in bales of cotton 
Uh, his translation included bitter anti-Catholic notes. In 1530, Henry VIII prohibited Tyndale's writings. And here's what he said. The common people have no need for all the Scripture in English. Indeed, the Catholic Church vigorously opposed Tyndale's work, so much so that in 1535 he was arrested, jailed in the castle of Vilvord outside of Brussels for over a year, and then placed on trial, tried for heresy, and it was in 1536 that he was strangled to death and his body burned at the stake by the Catholic Church. And yet his translation efforts were very valuable in the transmission of the New Testament. His word choices included uh, thing, words like senior, uh, senior versus priest, uh, love versus charity, uh, repent versus do penance. Uh, he used the word congregation as opposed to church. And by the way, some 92% of his New Testament is reflected in the King James Version, which came uh, some 75 or 85 years later. Well, after the work of uh, William Tyndale, we observe the work of Miles Coverdale. Here was the first person to issue a complete printed English translation of the Bible. Henry VIII had broken with the Roman Catholic Church by this time, 1533, uh, when he married Anne Boleyn. And so he basically tolerated Coverdale's work. Uh, Coverdale relied very heavily on the work of Tyndale and also compared it to the Latin Vulgate as well as Luther's work. And Luther, of course, uh, spoke German. So the Coverdale Bible came around 1535. Then we have the next major figure in English translation, John Rogers. Here is the second complete printed Bible in English. And by the way, he wrote under the pseudonym Thomas Matthew, even though his name was John Rogers. Consequently, his work in translation is called Matthew's Bible, 1537. He abandoned um, Catholicism as a result of the influence of William Tyndale. And so when Mary ascended the throne, he preached a sermon commending what he called the true doctrine taught in King Edward's days and even warned against, quote, pestilent, popery, idolatry, and superstition. Well, that may not have been the wisest thing to do, very courageous, but as a result, he was arrested, detained, and eventually sentenced to death for heretically denying the Christian character of the Church of Rome and the real presence in the sacrament. That's what he was charged with. Consequently, on February 4th, 1555, he was burned at the stake. The Matthews Bible, we said it was completed in 1537, used Tyndale's Old Testament for Genesis up to Chronicles. He then used Coverdale's work for Ezra to the end and for the New Testament. So the Matthews Bible, 1537. That brings us a couple of years later to Richard Taverner, who was the first, who produced the first Bible that was completely printed in England. He relied heavily on Matthew's Bible and only made slight adjustments. We owe Taverner for the use of the words parable and Passover. Those were major contributions of his efforts. That brings us then later that year to yet another Bible, which has become known as the Great Bible. Uh, Thomas Cromwell, who was secretary to Henry VIII, commissioned Coverdale to oversee producing a, a large Bible that could be placed in churches for member use. In fact, these Bibles were so huge and they were so valuable that they chained them to podiums and so forth in these churches, and hence it became known as the Great Bible, not because of its significance, but because of its size. That was in 1539. Based largely on Matthew's Bible, so it includes the New and Old Testament portions by Tyndale. The remaining books of the Old Testament had been translated by Coverdale, who used, by the way, mostly the Latin Vulgate and German translations as his sources, rather than going back and working from the original Greek 
and the original Hebrew text. So that's the Great Bible of 1539. Then we come to the final years of Henry VIII. Uh, by this time in his uh, reign, he completely suppressed free circulation of the Bible. But he died in January 1547. His son, Edward VI, came to the throne. Edward was on the throne from 1547 to 1553. He relaxed the restrictions on the circulation of the English Bible. Consequently, during his reign, a Tyndale's Bible, a Coverdale's work, Matthew's, Taverner's, and the Great Bibles were printed and circulated. But then Edward died and Mary ascended the throne. Consequently, on August 18, 1553, by royal proclamation, public reading of the Bible was prohibited. No Bibles were published. Bibles, in fact, were confiscated. Martyrs abounded. And the reformers fled England and fled to Geneva, resulting in, by the way, the Geneva Bible, 1560. Those who were exiled to Geneva, we're talking Switzerland, this became the center of Calvinistic Reformation. They printed a Bible. They presented it to Elizabeth, who finally was on the throne by the time they completed it. She had come to the throne about a year and a half earlier, and so they, pr they presented it to her as a gift. And the notes in the Geneva Bible uh, were very anti-Catholic and very pro-Calvinist. Some interesting features about the Geneva Bible. Earlier Bibles had no verse divisions. Instead, they were divided into sections with an A, a B, a C, and a D out in the margin. Well, the Geneva Bible was the first Bible to make each verse a separate paragraph. That was carried right on over into the King James and into translations today. It also used italics for added words. When a translator inserts a word to complete the sense in English, they would italicize it so that you knew that it was added. Do you know that the Geneva Bible 1560 was the first English Bible to have marginal notes and explanations? It really was the first what we would call study Bible. This was the Bible, the Geneva Bible, that was favored by the Puritans. Very popular, went through 180 editions. Some of Shakespeare's later plays reflect familiarity with the Geneva Bible. And in fact, the Mayflower Compact was signed on the Geneva Bible. Very influential, prominent English translation in the 16th century. Then we come to the Bishop's Bible. Matthew Parker was the fellow that orchestrated a revision of the English Bible. Most of the work was done by bishops, hence the name Bishop's Bible. It was essentially a revision of the Great Bible. It's been known as the second authorized English Bible since it was ordered to be placed in every cathedral and every bishop's house. It was presented to Elizabeth as a gift in 1568. About 4% of the form of the King James Bible came from the Bishop's Bible. You know, during this period, of course, as these Protestants were doing English translation, the Catholics, uh, though resistant for a, a good while, commenced to do their own translation, which came out between 1582 and 1610 and became known as the reims Douay Bible. Catholic re this was basically the Catholic response to Protestant translations during Elizabeth's reign. It was published by English exiles from Reims, France, and that's why the name Reims Douay. It was based on the Latin Vulgate and therefore shows heavy Latin influence rather than being translated from the Greek. A lot of notes included to respond to Protestants, the Reims Douay. For all practical purposes, we then come to 1611. An attempt to bring some uniformity to the multitude of English translations. A project was proposed in 1604 at Hampton Court Conference. And for some inexplicable reason, history doesn't tell us, uh, King James was intrigued and that caught his fancy. And so he decided to promote it and encourage it. Fifty-four translators were enlisted with a final committee of 12 to make the final decisions uh, men like Bishop Thomas Bilson, Dr. Miles Smith uh, were involved in adding finishing touches. 
Like all translations, when the King James uh, was actually released, it had a host of critics. Uh, by the way, the original King James Version 1611 contained the Apocrypha in between the Old and New Testaments. It also contained alternate readings in the margin like newer translations do today. And of course, since 1611, you know, we're talking three, four hundred years, the King James has gone through many revisions. If you looked at a 1611 King James and then looked at a King James today, uh, not only would the 1611 basically be undecipherable because of the older English, but it, there's been so much revision since the very beginning. Let me call your attention to a few lists of words that were used in the 1611 King James translation that have literally lost their meaning. That is, they, they convey no meaning to an English speaker today. Exodus 28, ouches of gold, and meat yard in Leviticus 19.35, and collops of fat in Job 15.27, uh, cast clouts, Jeremiah 38 and verse 12. And then words like sith and tabering. You can look these up uh, from the chart from my picture I'm giving you. A vain jangling in 1 Timothy 1.6, a murrain, muffler strake, brigandine, tro, uh, I tro not, swaddling clothes. What was Jesus uh, wrapped in? Swaddling clothes. Well, that should have been translated strips of cloth. You have almug and chode and earring and hosen and ligger and niesings in Job 41, 18 that comes from Leviathan. You have occurrent and pilled. Those are words that though they had meaning in 1611, they do not have meaning today. And then there's a whole host of words in the King James Version that uh, the word still has meaning, but it's changed meanings. That is, it no longer means what it meant in 1611, like the word mean. You know, today uh, we say if a person's mean, they're, you know, cruel. They're not very nice, Proverbs 22, 29. Well, then it meant uh, common. What about the word meat? We use to refer to flesh, like a steak. 1 Timothy 4.3, but of course in 1611, that was simply a generic term for food. A man's meat was his food. The word peculiar to us in Titus 2.14 conveys the idea of being odd or strange. But in 1611, it had to do with to whom you belonged. What about the word passenger in Proverbs 9.15? Well, in 1611, that meant a passerby. In 1 Thessalonians 4.15, the word prevent meant to come before, not to stop as we think of it. And in Romans 1.13, the word let, if we say he let it occur, then we mean he allowed it. But in 1611, that meant he just the opposite. He prevented it. He did not allow it. The word wealth in 1 Corinthians 10.24 is the idea of welfare. Conversation today is where a couple of people are engaging in a discussion, Ephesians 2.3 but then it referred to one's behavior, one's manner of life, how, how life was being lived. Well, there are many others of these that we could look at. Uh, I will simply list these for you on, uh, on this uh, presentation so that you can do your own study. You can look up these words and uh, understand your King James Bible better. And keep in mind that the point that we are making as we look through these lists of words that are used in the 1611 translation that have in fact changed meaning. Keep in mind that we're trying to press the point that when translation occurs, not only are humans fully capable of making such a translation from the Greek into the English, but we are able to discern the changes in meaning and language that occur over time. You see, the English language does not stay static. It, it, we're very grateful that Greek the language of the New Testament, Koine, is a dead language. That is, it was frozen into time and you can go back to that time period and know exactly what those words meant. But you know, the English language has continued to change and change and change, so much so that English dictionaries record thousands of new words and new word meanings constantly coming into our dictionaries. I don't suppose anyone knows how many words are going out of use. But you see, languages are always in a constant state of flux. And consequently, to get God's word from Greek into English or any other language, new translations are inevitable. 
Now it's interesting, after passing beyond the King James Version, we come to major English translation after that. You know, it was about 200, nearly 300 years when the British decided, you know what, it's time to take the King James primarily and to make a new edition, kind of revise it, they called it, the revised version. And uh, consequently, they put together, you know, a, a committee, a group of people to do this. And the result of their labors was the ERV, English Revised Version, completed by 1885. Well, they had invited some Americans to participate in this translation project. The Americans were concerned that there were too many Britishisms, uh, too many words in that version that were known to British-speaking people, but would be somewhat quaint or incommunicable to an American speaker. You know, General George Patton said uh, during World War II, I guess he was quoting Bernard Shaw, that uh, the British and the Americans are a people separated by a common language. Uh, British and American English differ in a great deal. So uh, these Americans decided to make adjustments that would be more suitable to an American English audience. And the result of their work came out in 1901 and is known as the American Standard Version and has been hailed really ever since as an outstanding version. It's many, time, it many times is called a very literal translation. Remember what that means in our last study. That means that the, the revisers, the translators tried to retain as much of the parent language's linguistic forms as it possibly could. The American Standard has been a great translation and impacted a lot over the years. As you move on down through history in the 1950s, the RSV, Revised Standard Version, which was an attempt to revise the ASV, came onto the scene. By the 70s, you had uh, the New English Bible and the New American Standard Bible. In 1976, the Today's English Version came out. In 1978, the New International Version. In 1980, the New King James Version came out. In 1990, the new Revised Standard Version, and in 2001, the English Standard Version arrived on the scene, and there have been many others. That's just kind of a hitting the high points of English translation as it involves major reputable translations that's done by a cross-section of uh, individuals from many different theological backgrounds. Now, let me suggest to you that it is true that the multitude of English translations can make it seem as if we do not know how the original read. Now, there are people who get very concerned about this. They'll be sitting in, in a Bible class or a church service and uh, they'll be looking at one translation. Maybe the person sitting next to them is looking at another translation and the preacher will refer to some passage and one of those individuals will look at the other one and say, well, my Bible doesn't say that. But let me suggest to you, as I've shown you in terms of how the Greek operates and how the translation process operates, if you will use reputable translations, use more than one, and do what the Bible tells us to do with regard to God's Word. What does the Bible tell us to do? Study. Give diligence. Don't just read it and put it down and go on with your life. Pour over it. The Bible demands that. We have got to search, explore, examine, study. So, multiple translations. Use commentaries and others that have a, a reputation of being accurate. We need to study. And I'm telling you, if you'll apply yourself as the Bible demands, there is no other alternative. The fact of the matter is, we can resolve any differences and come to satisfactory conclusions. Ultimately, the differences will not place any doctrinal matter in jeopardy. I warned you before and I caution you again. Be careful about making differences bigger than they really are. Just because there are differences does not mean that we've lost doctrine or we do not know God's Word or that that's somehow going to mean we don't know how to live the Christian life, we don't know how to become a Christian, we don't know how we can be acceptable to God. The differences that we're talking about do not place any of those matters in jeopardy. Let me try to give you just a little sample here very quickly. You ought to take uh, some different translations and lay them down on a table and turn to the same passage in all of those translations and compare them. 
I believe the vast majority of the time you will find that the differences are negligible. Look, for example, I just opened up Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and I laid side by side seven of the most prominent uh, translations done uh, over the last few hundred years. Uh, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, the King James says. All the other translations simply add an S to heaven. You know, the word heaven there in Genesis 1, 1 does not refer to the heavenly realm where God is. It refers to the heavens that Jews allude to when they allude to the first heaven, that's the atmosphere where the birds fly, and the second heaven, the cosmos, the, what we would call outer space. When you look at all of those translations, Genesis 1, 1, there's no real difference there. Let's go to a passage that's a little bit more of uh, doctrinal concern. How about Acts 2.38? If you look at these carefully, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The New King James has repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So instead of and be baptized, every one of you, let every one of you be baptized. Not much difference there. The NIV has repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Do you know, as a matter of fact, remission and forgiveness mean the same thing in English. The New American Standard Bible, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The ASV, repent ye and be baptized every one of you. That's pretty much the same. RSV, repent and be baptized every one of you. They use the word forgiveness. And the ESV, the most recent of the lot, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So you can see that even in a passage that would be considered rather significant, although there's nothing in Acts 2.38 that's not taught elsewhere in the New Testament, but it is one significant passage, and yet in what, seven major translations? There's virtually no difference. I'm telling you that that is exactly the situation as it comes into English translation. You know, we don't have time to talk about, well, what about the Chinese? What translations do they have available? I suppose there are more translation, more different translations in English than any other language in the world. If you were to move to China, you don't have 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, or 100 Chinese translations to choose from. There's no equivalent in China to the 1611 King James Version. And that's the case in Germany. That's the case in Russia. It's the case in, in uh, Spanish. You know, the, these countries that um, are very non-Christian, look at all of the Muslim countries that are very oriented toward Arabic and the like. Uh, any effort to get the Bible into Arabic has been resisted in those countries. So they don't have just a plethora of translations in Arabic to which they can go. Many times these countries, these backward non-Christian settings, are very dependent upon a single translation that would be considered by many scholars to be very inferior. And yet I'm convinced the Word of God is sufficiently flexible that it could be translated into an inferior translation and those people still have access to the Word of God. Consequently, we again ask the question that we began with at the beginning of this study. How do we know the Bible has been preserved accurately? Has the Bible been corrupted? And here has been our answer based upon the evidence that I've presented you. Number one, the Greek text has been authenticated. Number two, the translation process works. We know how to do it. It can be done, and it can be done in such a way that meaning is communicated accurately. And number three, looking back over the history of English translation. The differences in English translations in existence today are decipherable. We can sort them out. We can arrive at the truth. You know the ultimate conclusion to a study like this? All human beings can know the truth and be saved. That is, every human being of accountable age and accountable mind can know these fundamental truths. God exists. What God are you talking about? The God of the Bible. The Bible is His Word. No other books on the planet are. 
Number three, only Christianity is the religion of that God of the Bible. That's the only religion that the God of the Bible approves of. Number four, in order to become a Christian, you must obey the gospel of Christ through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. There is God's plan of salvation articulated, for example, in Acts 2 uh, by Peter on the day of Pentecost and the other apostles and then repeated over and over through the rest of Acts. Everybody that listened to the Christian message, listened to the gospel, listened to what Christ had done for them, when it came down to doing what they were supposed to do in order to accept that and become a saved individual, they all did the same thing. They had faith, they repented of their sins, they confessed Christ with their mouth, and then they were immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And then we must live the Christian life. And everybody can do that. What do you mean by that? Well, you, you must attend the corporate assembly of the Lord's church every Sunday. You must worship the way He tells you to worship, not the way people want to worship, but pleases them. And you must live your daily life. The New Testament has injunctions about how husbands and wives and parents and children and, and how employers and employees, how everyone is to live the Christian life. Now, I'm telling you, all human beings can know the truth and be saved. And there are no exceptions. All human beings are accountable to the, for these fundamental doctrines and applying them to their lives. And I'm telling you that there are no excuses for those who say, oh, no, we, we can't know. The Bible's been corrupted. I've lost my faith. I used to believe in God and Christ in the Bible, but I don't anymore because I read Bart Ehrman's book or whatever. There will be no excuses for that. Because when the evidence is laid out on the table, we can know the Bible has not been corrupted. We have the Word of God available to us. May God bless you in your efforts to be a Christian and to live the Christian life faithfully before the God of the universe.